You've seen the big plays. Jaron stepping to his right, looking, looking, stopping, firing, end zone, touchdown! You've heard what the playmakers and coaches have had to say. Up for a three, got it! But now it's time to go behind the mic with BYU Sports Broadcasters to get their distinctive take on the games. Oh, what an aggressive play! This is Behind the Mic with host Cleon Wall. We're here to bring you unique insights and stories from the BYU Sports Broadcasters who cover the Cougars and from the Cougars themselves. Today we're talking about a potential bounce-back season for the men's volleyball team with Steve Vale and Jerem Jordan. But first, here is Gustin for three. The BYU women's basketball team is on a roll, winning their seventh straight game, 78-59 over San Francisco. Double-double machine Lauren Gustin scored 27 points and grabbed 19 rebounds in the victory. Before the game, I caught up with former Cougar hoopster and current analyst Kristen Kozlowski. She talked about the Cougars' amazing turnaround in WCC play. I think things are starting to click for this team. Um, anytime that you have a new coach, you have new roles, new system, it takes a little bit of time to go through the growing pains of that. And I think it's pretty clear now their individual roles. It's clear as a team that um, whether it's their motion offense, that read and react offense that they're trying to learn. I think they've figured that out. They have better chemistry on the court. And it helps to have a player like Lauren Gustin and how she's playing in the last six games. In those six games that they've won, she's averaging 21.5 rebounds per game and 14.5 points per game. So if you have a player that's playing at such an elite level like that to kind of carry it, be consistent inside and outside the paint, it's going to be helpful to win games. Uh, I do want to get back to Lauren Gustin here in a moment, but I want to ask about defense because Amber Whiting preached defense before the season. By the numbers, they've been defending like crazy. Their opponents are averaging 50 points a game. Anything special they're doing on the defensive end? Or are they just outworking other teams? Or or, or, or is it partly also maybe some of the teams they're playing just aren't that good? I definitely think the teams that they're playing are good. I think uh, it goes back to kind of that learning curve for this team. Anytime that you're getting a new defensive scheme put in, it takes time to understand when that second Line of defense needs to be there. That help side rotation, the V-back needs to be there. Um, and so now we're seeing kind of the, the fruit of the benefit of what has been happening in practices every single day. I know that she focuses a lot on breaking down the defense, breaking it down in defensive drills and kind of coming together when it's five on five, making sure that these girls understand what's required, whether it's jump to the ball, whether it's three quarter to front inside. Um, those are all kind of the new defensive principles that were implemented when Amber Whiting took the job. And so you're seeing that as well as the offense, but the defensive uh, focus for this team has been huge. And I know that that's something that the staff is focused on and continuing to just pound into these girls to understand their role on defense and what, what they require. I think you're also seeing the girls get a little more comfortable in terms of just when you execute a game plan, you can play a little bit more free when you know your role. Um, and so we're seeing that where they're not so worried about making a mistake or not doing exactly what they're supposed to, but they're able to execute the game plan better and take away some of the strengths of the teams that they're playing against. Well, we've all been gushing over Lauren Gustin. Uh, she's the team's leading scorer, the team's leading rebounder. The rebounding is the thing that just sticks out to you. Why is she so good at it? I, you know, I'm thinking blocking out, hustling. Is there something else that I'm missing, though? <laughs> I get this question more times than you could probably count about Lauren Gustin. Um, everybody knows that she's the top rebounder. I mean, she definitely has the target on her back. She's going to be at the top of every scouting report to keep her off the boards. So it's really remarkable that she's pulling in such elite numbers like this, knowing that, knowing that she has that big target on her back, knowing that they're going to put one, two, maybe three defenders on her to block her out when that shot goes up. Um, pretty remarkable. I mean, she's super athletic. She's obviously very, very in tune with her physique and being in the gym and working on herself and her strength to get stronger as a player. I do know because she's playing high minutes, she's about 37.5 minutes per game. That's seventh in the country right now. She's playing big minutes. So she's had to back off being in the weight room a little bit just to kind of balance that out. So she's not overdoing herself. But when it comes to rebounding for Lauren Gustin, if you watch her and you really watch her, even when the ball's not in her hands, she is constantly going. She's relentless on the board. She's positioning herself where she can go get it once she sees where it's going to come off and really anticipating where that ball is going to come off. And then she moves outside of her area. So even if she has a defender on her, she's going to try and either a swim move or just kind of a technique to hold them off with her hip to go and get that ball. And, and sometimes when you see rebounders, they kind of stand and watch and it falls in their area or the kind of the luck of the draw, right? Where it just falls right in their hands. That's not the case for Lauren. She's really having to go get 
these rebounds and some of them are coming when she's missing shots and she's right around the rim and she kind of sticks with it and finishes it. But a lot of credit to her work ethic, uh, putting in time and reps in practice and just being prepared. Nani Falatea, she's consistently scoring in double digits right now. She's dishing out tons of assists too. Lauren may be the leader, but has Nani kind of found her role as the as the floor general, getting the ball to the right person at the right time and also scoring when she needs to? Yeah, Nani, I think, is key for this team and why they're having such success these last six games. Um, she is just solid. I, I really, the one word that describes Nani for me is smooth. And we say that a lot about her, her game is just the way that she's able to glide across the court and the, just the ability to see the floor, to keep her eyes up and to make passes where you're just going, I cannot believe she fed that ball through three defenders and right into her, her teammates' hands, right? She's very good at anticipating where the defense is going to rotate and not making a bad pass or making a pass in time before the defense rotates. So high IQ player, incredibly strong. She has a good base, very strong player, great body control too. And when she turns that corner off the screen and she's playing downhill, she can really raise up, but have enough body control to finish a shot. Um, But I love the way she's playing. It's hard to believe she's a sophomore. Offensively, only Nani and Lauren are averaging double digits right now. Is there anyone else who could uh, or should maybe step up right now offensively? I think you're seeing Ariel Mackey Williams and Kaylee Smyre kind of your other two go guards. Um, They might be a little bit more inconsistent in terms of putting up big numbers or having an off game. But I think those two players are adapting to the role they need to play in that specific game. So I've seen games where Smyre might not even score a shot or score till the very end, but she is locking up players that she needs to. So she can be that defensive specialist for this team. Um, she's been really good about, about figuring out that role and, and not trying to play too much outside that role. So if they need her to score and hit shots, she's hitting shots. If they need her to defend, she's doing that. She's running the floor in transition. Uh, more importantly with Smiler is her leadership. And that's something this team, obviously being so young, really, really needed from her. And she stepped up into that role. And, th- and then if you look at Ariel Mackey Williams, she's a dynamic guard and she has capability to really put up big numbers. We saw her you know, very first game out of the gates at Colorado State, she had 18 points. So one of her best games of the season. Um, and it's been a little bit up and down, I would say for her. But now that she's back in the starting rotation, she's figuring out that she really can be that third player in double figures, very capable off the dribble, can play downhill, can shoot from the outside. She's shooting a great percentage from the outside right now, about 47%. So consistent outside score. Um, and so I think she adds a great dynamic to what you already have with Nani Falate and Lauren Gustin. When you look at the rotation, right now it's about seven women who are in and out of the lineup. You'll see someone else every once in a while, but you have seven main women in and out of that lineup. Is that going to spell doom later in the season? Will, will these women wear down? And you already talked about uh, Lauren's number of minutes that she's playing so far this season. I don't think it will spell doom uh, necessarily for this team. Obviously, if injuries happen, that's where you kind of run into some hiccups as a team and changing rotation and things like that. But uh, in terms of Gustin playing eight minutes, you've also got Nani who plays in the 30s uh, minute wise. These are players that are used to that at this point in the season. They know what's expected of them. They know that they're going to have to be out there on the court. They play in a way where they're not going to get in foul trouble and can manage their minutes. And I think Amber does a really good job of, of trying to really manage the minutes. If they're going to get a lead, then she's going to try and get a blow early for Gustin if she needs it or for Nani Falatea. Um, depth is an issue always for teams if you don't have that depth. And that's just something that Amber Whiting walked into. It doesn't matter who was taking this job. Um, BYU didn't have the depth. They had such a turnover in their roster. So you try to develop that depth as you go throughout the season and in some blowout games, try to play some of these players off the bench more and get them more comfortable. Um, But I think with a seven, eight player rotation, I think Amber's pretty comfortable now with her rotation. And I don't see that that being a downfall as the season progresses, as long as they can stay healthy. If you're a player or coach, you don't want to look ahead, but you know, we're in the media so we can look ahead, right? Um, are, are you looking ahead to those last two games of the season against conference leaders Portland and Gonzaga? I, I know BYU's been successful so far in the conference after losing to those two teams, but it, 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 do you kind of like look aside and you're like, eh, those two teams, those are the teams the BYU needs to beat. Right, right. Well, here's the positive in that, right? They've already had to play them on the road, which was the toughest stretch that they had already playing at Gonzaga at Portland, losing those games. So 
I know that they're very grateful that they're going to get them back at home at the very end of February to play them um, in the Marriott Center. Um, and, and those are just two tough teams, no matter how you look at it. They're, they produce players every single year that can step up, elite players, elite scorers, um, always tough to play Gonzaga. And Portland has really risen to that and continue to finish at the top of the conference. And so I think everybody kind of has that circle on their calendar. But if you're BYU and, and Amber Whiting and her coaching staff, they're not going to look too far ahead. They know that they have to continue to take one game at a time. And, and then otherwise, those two games at the end are kind of, you know, past the point of if you're losing games all the way up until that, cause you're looking so far ahead, it's, it's hard to recover. Right. So one game at a time for this uh, coaching staff and try to improve and continue to improve. That's kind of been their philosophy all season is get better. How can we get better? And how can we learn? Even if we lose a game, how can we learn from that? And then you hope at that point at the end of February that you're fully prepared and you've adapted um, to some challenges you've faced along the way, and you can adjust to what you didn't do well in the first two meetings and do that at the end of February and get some wins. That's Kristen Kozlowski. The BYU men's volleyball team was 8-17 and last year, including a nine-game losing streak in the middle of the season and a six-game losing streak to end the season. Capono Brown, four aces now. He's got seven in six sets. But they started Timeout. this season off 2-0 and before a tilt with Fairleigh Dickinson. So I asked the volleyball duo of Jerem Jordan and Steve Vail if they were impressed with the first two victories of the season. Uh, first of all, I was very impressed. I uh, I had a feeling they were probably going to take care of McKendry, but the fact that uh, that Lewis was ranked and they had put up a really good showing against Irvine the night before, I did not see BYU doing very well Saturday night. So I was shocked at how well BYU played. Um, I don't think Lewis looked as good Saturday as they did Friday, but regardless, um, BYU played really well. I, I didn't, I, I don't ever really know uh, year to year until we get back into the studio and, and we start talking with the coach again uh, to know exactly the changes they made, who they've brought on, uh, how different they're going to look this year as to last year. Um, I had a little bit of information and I thought, I think got some really nice pieces, but you know, that's on paper. That's one thing. Getting them in the gym in front of thousands of people, uh, you know, can they perform? Can they execute? And they, man, I've been really impressed by how well they played this last weekend. I agree. The win over Lewis was really nice because this is still a young team. This isn't a team competing for the national championship this year and probably not even the conference championship. I think in a year or two, though, they have some really nice young weapons. They've got a graduate setter that's kind of one and done with BYU this year that's really changed things. Six foot seven, Heath Hughes from Grand Canyon, who last year that was an issue. The starting setter midway through the season isn't even on the team, and the backup setter was a walk on, undersized, doing his best, not super effective. So this team is better. Are they good enough to be north of 500 and perhaps like a third place team in the MPSF? Yeah. Uh, they're going to win some matches that we're going to go, hey, look at this team. And then they're going to lose somewhere we go, whoa, what's going on? So it's, it's not the yeah. kind of 20, 2021 group where you have like three or four All-Americans. But in a year or two, I'm very excited about this team as they kind of grow together. What, what has been that difference from last season to this season? Setter is a big one for me. Okay, so we talked about setter. Okay, yep. what else? The experience of the outside hitters. So Luke Benson's a backup last year that comes in to serve. He's one of the starting outsides now. Mix Romanis is a redshirt freshman last year. He has a full year under his belt. Those guys growing, developing. A few other key pieces have come in as well. Uh, Trent Moser is a USA U21 kid, true freshman, who's going to get some playing time here real quick. They brought, brought in Brazil's U19 libero who's a really good passer, good hitter as well, kind of a backup. There's just more talent on the group than last year, and I think, honestly, it's, the setter's like a quarterback. If you have great receivers and great O-line and running backs, you're you're still going to be limited, right, in the pass game. Anything you want to add, Steve? Yeah, I, those are all great points. The other thing, they had you know, two or three guys that were vying for that uh, opposite hitter uh, position, and – Boy, I'll tell you, Capono Brown has like solidified himself as BYU's uh, oppo. His his offensive goal everywhere, even uh, even from the service line, his contribution this last weekend has been phenomenal. And so, I think that's a big piece as well. BYU is always known to have a really strong opposite hitter. Uh, we could name a few down the road, but uh, the reality is, Co- Capono. Stepping into that and, and becoming that role has been huge, I think, for BYU. And, and if the other pieces kind of 
uh, come together, I think BYU absolutely over 500. Easy. We had Capono on uh, Cougar Tailgate, the Cougar Tailgate podcast recently, and he said right now BYU is just like the perfect fit for him. It didn't fit well in Stanford. He's now at BYU. It's a perfect fit. Steve, you kind of alluded to it already. Is it just because you feel like he's taken on this role perfectly, like he's the perfect opposite hitter and he's just that perfect guy in that position? Well, I think that's part of it, but also I think when there's three guys vying for that spot, they have a pretty short leash, and if they make one or two errors, they're looking over at the coach, waiting for him to yank them off the court, and that does not do anything for anybody's confidence, right? However, this year, I don't, for whatever reason, Capono has just, he, I, maybe he just told himself uh, uh, over and over again over the this last year in the mirror, you know, hey, you're the guy, you're the guy because he absolutely played fearlessly and uh, literally like almost zero errors both nights. It was awesome. Jerem, you mentioned Heath Hughes. He comes to BYU from Grand Canyon. He's going to play here one year. How is he molded into this team, at least two matches-wise, how is he molded in this team so perfectly? Great experience. He's on the USA Collegiate Beach national team, so he's got great skill. If you're a beach player, as Steve was and is, right, you have great ball skills, setting, passing, hitting, defending, blocking, serving. Like you, You're a very well-rounded player. And he comes in ready to I- I explore his skill set. He was the starter for about two and a half years at Grand Canyon, lost the job there. And then now he's at BYU, which is one of the top three programs in the country in prestige and accomplishment. Certainly BYU is trying to climb back in the rankings to that spot. But it's a huge opportunity for him to kind of be the leader of a younger group that's rebounding from an off year where they can immediately be better. Helps to be 6'7", uh, good blocker, good defender. Sean Olmstead was improved uh, or, or impressed by his improvement there. And a good server. It just... It's nice when the setter is a guy that you go, okay, he's he's going to lead us to something good here as opposed to, well, hopefully they don't just smash a ball over the top of him. I think the fact that he cut his bangs short of his eye line so he could actually see <laughs> was really important because he was, honestly, preseason, he was wiping it out of his face the whole time. Now that he can see, he's an amazing setter. <laughs> We also get hair care, uh, <laughs> hair care uh, uh, advice here on on yeah. uh, behind the mic. So that's always good. Uh, middle blockers: Gavin Julian, Tion Taylor. I, maybe I'm missing a few guys in there, but those are the two guys I noticed in those first two matches. What's the lowdown on these guys? How how are they progressing? How are they doing so far with this team? So Gavin uh, apparently was just getting back on the court as of last weekend, so he was even kind of an unknown for Sean. They didn't use him a whole lot. Uh, at first, but then began to, and this kid, his, his timing, his ability to how high he reaches, uh, he is huge for BYU. And the fact that he's healthy again and, and then that starting role, I think Hughes needs to just find him over and over again because I've said it multiple times. Once you establish that middle, uh, it frees up your pin hitters a lot more to be able to have a one-on-one, maybe a one-on-two as opposed to three blockers up every time. So having Gavin healthy uh, and being a big part of this offense is going to be huge for BYU. Then Tion Taylor's an amazing story. He didn't play club in high school, just high school, yet he's a D1 guy. And last year led BYU hitting 468, really emerged kind of midway through the season. That opening weekend in the two matches, nine kills on 11 swings, hit 727. Just incredible stuff. Sean Olmstead told us, uh, you know, leading up to the matches this weekend, we got to find the middle more uh, because these two guys can can play. And when you open up the middle, the pins uh, find some one on ones out there. All right, last questions here for you guys. W- what's the strength right now of this team? Yeah, Jeremy, you mentioned they're still pretty young. They're still coming together. We, you know, maybe they're not going to win a national championship this season, but maybe down the road. What's the strength of this team right now, and where do they need to improve? We'll go with Jeremy first, and then we'll go to Steve. I think it's the chip on their shoulder and the hunger from last year's disappointment of. BYU is this mighty program that's gone to the national championship game here five times the last decade or whatever and hasn't won it, still seeking that. And then it wasn't just that. It was that they took a step backwards. It was one of the worst seasons in BYU history. I think they're really hungry, and they're young, and they're coachable and moldable, and they've worked extremely hard. Luke Benson uh, on the weekends goes in to the gym on his own time to get a ton of passes in because he didn't play because he couldn't pass last year very well. They are hungry to get in there. And they're young and excitable, and I, I think that hunger is 
is churning out some extra hard work that with a little bit of talent, a couple more pieces as they gather will lead to, okay, now we're back contending for conference championships. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with everything said there. Also, I will add this. Um, they got punched in the eye last year. They got kind of embarrassed. Uh, and as Jerry mentioned, maybe one of the worst seasons BYU has ever had. That's not something that any of these guys – take lightly they are very hungry also i think right now they're kind of flying under the radar so they might actually shock a few teams when they come into the gym and start playing at that byu caliber uh even though you know everyone's looking for last year and and, and what they did picking up a six seven uh very experienced setter has been huge for byu i think that's a big strength for them they've got some great servers that once they kind of get their feet under them and, and can really get after that serve, they're going to put other teams in trouble, get them out of system, and BYU is such a good blocking team. Um, I think they're going to shock some people this year. I think they're going to continue to climb the, uh, the charts there. I think, what are they, at 13 right now? They were unranked going into the season. I think they're going to continue to climb the charts. Thanks to Steve Vale, Jerem Jordan, and Kristen Kozlowski for joining Behind the Mic. Make sure you download and subscribe to the podcast and give us a rating. Behind the Mic is a production of BYU Radio.